this meeting back to order. Colleagues, for the second panel we have appearing before us from Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance, Professor David Lepofsky, who is the chair. Mr. Chair, I want to thank you for being here. And of course, from the Council of Canadians with Disabilities, we have Ms. Heather Awakis, who is the national chair joining us by video conference. We'll begin with opening remarks, and for that, I'll turn the floor over to you, Mr. Lepofsky. The floor is yours. Thank you, and I want to thank the excellent team of, uh, of law students from the law school at Western who've provided tremendous support for what I'm going to say. Anything that's wrong is my fault. Anything that's right is their fault. Enough is enough. As a blind person, I dread entering Canadian airspace. I never know whether the service I'm going to get for basic accommodation needs that are well known and easy to provide will be reliable or pathetic. We heard from Air Canada today that they're doing a good job, that they've put in place measures that are needed to fix this, that the problems are few or infrequent and that uh, really all they need is more education or training for their staff. Every single one of those statements is wrong. And that Air Canada's leadership said this is proof that we need far more systemic solutions. Let me offer you some. Number one, the U.S. has a Air Passengers with Disabilities Bill of Rights. Why? Don't we? It is absurd that on a flight to Atlanta three weeks ago, my email from Air Canada told me about the American Bill of Rights, but nothing about the services available as a blind passenger in Canada, even though I'm on record and file as a blind passenger. We need a new regulatory agency to oversee accessibility of air travel. The Canadian Transportation Agency has had this mandate for not years, but decades. They have failed, and they are failing, and it's because they're too close to the airlines. Keep leaving it with them, you're going to keep getting the same results. How surprising is it that so few of us file so, so few complaints with their process. If you read the accessible airline tra or air travel regulations they passed in 2019, they are more loopholes than rules. The fact of the matter is, they read like they were written by the airlines. How about another basic solution? easier than changing the regulatory requirements, or regulatory agency. How about requiring airlines to automatically tell us passengers with disabilities what services they offer? Not having to go running around their websites one airline at a time, hoping we can find it, hoping it is up to date. Oh, and assuming that we have a computer and can afford it and have adaptive tech and can use it. How about mandatorily requiring something like the U.S. Bill, uh, Bill of Rights for Passengers with Disabilities? How about telling us in every notification who to call for a support, who to call for curbside assistance? This is not rocket science, but they don't do it. How about having one-stop support? How about having a fast action fast service disability hotline at each airline. You phone it and you don't wait on hold for an hour and you don't have to listen to miserably nerve-wracking music. You just get someone who can route you through to the solution. It could be the way to request services and to file complaints. How about requiring the airlines on our flights and the airports in their announcements to regularly announce the availability of that hotline 
If more people knew how to complain, the CEO of Air Canada wouldn't be coming here telling you how few complaints they get. How about requiring uh, the regulator to deploy secret shoppers so we have independent monitoring of how their services are? You heard from the CEO of Air Canada that they now announce pre-boarding for passengers with disabilities. Not on the Air Canada flight I was on last night to come here. How about having an assured front desk check-in in a large airport like at uh, Terminal 1 in Toronto, where you don't have to try to brave a phalanx of stanchions and uh, check-in machines and other confusing signage and so on, where you could check in right so inside the door. Air Canada didn't have it. Let's just say somebody got an interesting idea and eventually they did have it, then they killed it, then I asked them to restore it, then they didn't, then I heard they did, but only for some flights, not others. If you can't figure it out, imagine how I feel. How about requiring that one person will guide you through the whole airport rather than being passed from one person to the next, sometimes as many as three or four, like you're a baton in a relay race, in a relay race. We heard about the need for training. Can I tell you, and I'm just giving you my experience, lots of people with disabilities can tell you the same, how many of their ground assistance persons assigned to guide me, I have to teach how to guide a blind person. Did I mention this is not rocket science? These aren't bad people. They're in a bad system that needs to be fixed. Let me wrap up telling you that there are lots more things we could require, but how about standards for new airport design, or aircraft design? I was just on a plane two weeks ago where, you know that emergency or that call button to let the flight attendant know you need help? It's, it's always been a physical button. But more and more, it's a touch screen that blind people can't, can't operate. I mean, did they just invent blind people? This is ridiculous. Now, I don't want to make it sound like it's all Air Canada. These need to be done, uh, measures need to be across the board. Air Canada is not the leader that we want airlines to follow. We need them all to become leaders Thank you. Uh, and to change their practices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lepofsky. We'll begin our line of questioning today with Mr. Strahl. Mr. Strahl, you have six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, Mr. Lepofsky, I, I found your comments about being handed off three or four times in a, in an airport like a baton, I think you said, um, to be interesting. We've, we've been talking about um, making sure that that uh, people are, are treated with respect, with dignity, and, and are provided a good uh, service from the time they get out of their vehicle or whatever transport they've used to get to the airport until they're seated in the aircraft. So can you... Can you perhaps talk about whether your, your comments are focused largely on Air Canada? I assume that's who you've had the most experience with. Has it been any different when you've traveled with any other domestic Canadian airlines? And when you travel, for instance, you, you reference the United States. I, I see in some prepared remarks here you also um, traveled to Israel, etc. Where have you had the best experience? Uh, in terms of, and with what airline, uh, in terms of not being passed from, uh, from person to person through the airport? Thank you. Uh, number one, I've talked a lot about Air Canada, but it's not limited to Air Canada in terms of my experience in Canada. Number two, my better experiences is anywhere outside this country. Hmm. I'm, I'm sorry to say that. And I'm embarrassed as a Canadian to say that. But it proves others can get it right. Why the heck can't we? When I talked about uh, passing, being passed like a baton, for the longest time, for decades, at Terminal 1 in Toronto, you came through with one person taking you from the airplane all the way through customs and getting your bags and out the door and into a cab. Now, 
because uh, some geniuses put their heads together and thought this was a better thing. For the last 10, 15, 20 meters, maybe 50, you have to be passed to an airport authority person. Literally, for the last few meters. Um, and you spend more time having the two, of the two ground officials taking your uh, boarding pass and scanning that you're leaving one and being the pass to the other one than it takes to get out the darn door. Try that after a 13-hour flight when you just want to get home and go to bed. Uh, when you come in at uh, in uh, uh, Toronto again at Pearson at Terminal One, and I'm just going to give this as an illustration. We haven't audited right across the airport. We can't. We're volunteers, but it's important for you to understand this. You come into the counter, and then they tell you to sit and wait, sometimes upwards of an hour, but the seats aren't right next to where the staff are. So you're sitting there for an hour. You you can't ask somebody, hey, where's the bathroom? Uh, a couple of flights ago, I actually thought they had forgotten me. There's no one to ask, so I just stood up. I heard someone sound like an airport, and how's this for dignity? Standing up and bellowing, excuse me, do you work for the airlines? Like, why should we have to do that? Similarly, on the way out, again, depending on this baton passing, you could be escorted from the aircraft to a seating area before you go through customs and then told to wait, someone will come and get you. You ask how long, they don't know, and they leave. There's no staff there to ask. I've sat there hearing somebody in another seat next to me saying, I need help, I need to go to the bathroom. This is an adult in public in an airport. Welcome to Canada. This is not the way we should be treated. And this, in, in all of these experiences you have Obviously, when you've booked your ticket, inform the airline that you require extra assistance and they're still unprepared to deliver a seamless um, it, it, service. It's totally inconsistent. There are times you get, the people are nice. Don't get me wrong. The people are nice. They're not surly. They don't need sensitivity. Excuse me. They, they need staff sufficient and a system that says from the aircraft all the way out the door. Uh, some do it. It varies from day to day, flight to flight. Um, and, and yes, in my file, before I do a booking, it's automatically set out uh, that I have a vision disability and that I need ground assistance. And usually when I book the reservation and I get the electronic ticket, it says it right there. But it doesn't tell you who to call for help. Um, one last thing, just getting from the front curb into the airport, why should this be so complicated? Why can't there be a one-stop phone number to call? Instead, you've got to figure out different airport airlines do it differently. And if you've got the wrong number, there's nowhere to call to get the right number. So it's just, anyway, this is, none of this is tough. Mm -hmm. This just requires, and, and by the way, the last thing, and I want to focus on this just for a minute, sir, if I may. Um, Senior executives of airlines need to be held personally accountable. Not just that they can hire a Carrie Ann Wilson, who's, who's a, a really good person and really dedicated, and then tell people like me, go talk to her. That's what he told you uh, when, when he was pressed about what he meet. With me, it was, well, uh, me or her, go, well, it'd be good to talk to her. They need to not be shielded by people. They need to talk to us directly. And I'd be happy to if he would be agreeable to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Strahl, and thank you, Mr. Lepofsky. Next, we have Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, the floor is yours. You have six minutes, sir. Thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome to our guest today. Uh, Ms. Walkus and then Mr. Uh, Lepofsky, maybe you can uh, make comments after the fact. Uh, there, there's a question here. Um, we've heard from uh, WestJet, Air Canada, Airlines. Uh, we've heard from airport personnel from CAT. Uh, who've all claimed they have some sort of assistance programs in place. Uh, yet, we've seen and heard of the stories of mistreatment and uh, neglect, some of which you've alluded to today in your travels. So can you speak to um, Ms. Walkers, first of all, to end-to-end -end service and potentially share where you think uh, the gaps are in uh, the airline industry? Prochainement, nous avons Mr. Barcelou Duval. Mr. Barcelou Duval, you have six minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Earlier on in the testimony from Air Canada, we were told that only 0.15% of cases were those of, sorry, Mr. Barsad Udiva. I just want to make sure. The translation? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to confirm you were. Excuse me, Mr. Barsad Udiva. Go ahead, you may continue, Mr. Barsad Udiva. So what I was saying is that Air Canada, or its representatives, were saying that they have 0.15 or 0.15% of cases where there are complaints from people who uh, have um, mobility aids or uh, persons with disabilities. You seem to be, the t uh, you seem to travel a fair bit yourselves. Ms. Walkis, is, is it true that it's only 0.15% of the times that you travel that you have problems occur? How frequently do these things actually occur? For me, 95% of the time. In fact, I can't remember one trip that there wasn't a, a major issue for me, either almost missing my flight or being uh, parked somewhere. Um, it's almost every time. And again, as David mm. said, we are spending an inordinate amount of time training their staff. Monsieur Lepovsky. Uh... Mr. Lepovsky. Disability, I talk to about this and I get lots of feedback in my leadership role with my coalition. Everyone has had problems. I'm not meaning all the time. I don't even know if it's most of the time. But whenever we get on a plane, we never know what we're in for and we have to be ready for the worst. But let's take that statistic and let's tear it apart. Most of us, I think, I certainly can say for myself, I have not filed complaints about 99.9% .9 of the incidents. I wouldn't have time to eat, sleep, or, or do anything else if that's all I did. Number two, I, I dare say most people don't know how or where to file complaints, even if they want to. That should be announced in the airports. That should be announced on every flight. That should be included on every ticket. Number three, lots of people travel on our airlines, but end up outside Canada. And when they get back to their home countries, if they've had a bad experience, you think they're calling the, up to find out which regulatory agency deals with uh, the problems they faced and, and how to file a complaint, and they're going to get involved in some long legal process? I, I, I don't think so. So when Air Canada comes up with those numbers, or any other airline, they're Forgive me, but they're in effect trivializing what we're facing. Right. Now, in fairness, the, the CEO of Air Canada said it, he knows it's underreported and he knows there are more, so I, I want to be fair to that. But to be able to say you're doing a good job and these are, these are the numbers is to be shockingly out of touch with our experience. And either, I, there's just a huge coincidence that the only people who happen to talk to me about this who have disabilities have had these problems, or... It's a bigger problem, and I, I leave it to you to decide which, which it is. Merci, sir. Thank you. That answers my question very well, which leads me somewhere else. Mr. Lepovsky, let's continue with you. In your opening statement, you referred to the CTA, and you seem to be dissatisfied. Could you tell us a little bit about the ways in which... You, perhaps you have had to had, have dealings with the CTA. Um, you s said that you don't fill out a complaint every time. What is the issue with the CTA, the Canadian Transportation Agency, as to the ways in which these complaints are dealt with? Okay, the first problem is there's no rapid solution. I mean, there's the, you, if you file a complaint, better be ready for a very, very long process. And to be honest, life's too short. Okay, like, we just can't, we can't live that way and have a life. The, the second problem is they are too close to the airlines industry. It's, it's a classic example of the recurring problem of regulatory capture. It's not unique to the CTA. It's not unique to regulators in Canada, but it's obvious. For example, if you read their 
regulations they passed in 2019. We, in our brief, we have a link to our critique of those regulations when they were under consideration. And they, they really are, read like they're written by the airlines. They're just way too, you know, you've got to do this, except you can do, you're required to do X, except. And then there's all these loopholes that are, are bigger than the rights. And so there, and, and the, the other final point, even if you were to uh, disagree, and I'm not saying you do, but even if we assume for the moment you disagreed with everything I just said, the bottom line is this. They are mandated to regulate airlines accessibility. They've had that mandate for decades. That didn't come with the Accessible Canada Act. They've had it for decades. These problems have existed for decades. In significant ways, they've not gotten better, and in some ways, they've gotten worse. So the regulator has failed to Thank achieve you. the result that we are entitled to. And Thank you very if you much. keep going back to them, I suspect you're going to get the same result. Thank you, Mr. Lepofsky. And thank you. Merci, Mr. Barcelo Duval. Next, we have Mr. Backrack. Mr. Backrack, the floor is yours. You have six minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I want to, again, thank you, Professor Lepofsky, for, for being here and for um, stating so clearly and adamantly what the problem is and the urgency of, of making progress on this. And I, I'm, I'm trying to uh, decide where, where to start and how to add to this conversation with some questions. But it seems like from listening to you uh, that the two themes that have really come up are around consistency and accountability. And I share your frustration because this committee hears from many corporations who come here and tell us about their good works from very well-meaning people. And it feels after many meetings like that that it's too great of an expectation to expect these companies to proactively and voluntarily address these systemic issues. Where does the buck stop when it comes to accountability? Number one, with the regulator that's not holding them accountable. Number two, with the CEOs. And number three, and we're not partisan when I say this, but with the rep ministers and the government that have the authority to do it, a summit is a photo op. Excuse me, but it's like they may discuss things, they may come up with good stuff, but they don't need to wait two months for a summit to deal with the 19 issues that are in our brief. And the 19 recommendations are not like something that we somehow magically innovated they couldn't have thought of, like having people know what rights they have and where to get service at the airline. I mean, my theme again, it's not rocket science. So what we need is concrete action. The other thing is, um, you know, with respect to the um, airlines and the CTA having consultative committees, uh, and that's great, where they bring some people with disabilities, they, they ask, but these are recurring problems. None of, I, I'm not saying anything that people with disabilities, and I believe airlines haven't known about for years and decades. So it's not that they need to hear more from us. They need to actually do something about it. And it would be wrong for this committee to sort of recommend, and I'm not saying you're going to, but to, to, to think the solution is tell each airline to set up a disability advisory committee so that we have to volunteer our services to these for-profit companies to keep telling them one after the other the, except, the exact same thing. The solution is to legislate the requirements, effectively enforce them. And that's what we've listed in our brief. So effective legislation, effectively enforced, and the buck stops with the minister who's responsible for the regulator and for setting the parameters within which the airlines operate? And, and the CEOs. And the CEOs. Absolutely. And I'm not trying to be personal to the CEO of any airline. It happens that one was here today. And I am sure they're all well-intentioned, but in the disability world, everybody's well-intentioned towards us. But we keep facing the barriers. So the solution is saying, if the, if the CEO of each airline said to their uh, airlines, no more passing people like a baton, no more seating people where they have to call out to strangers if they need to go to the bathroom, uh, let's tell everybody where, what single number they got to call for help, and it will actually get answered in, oh, I don't know, five minutes, not an hour? If they all did that, and if they said there are consequences down the line if it doesn't happen, it could happen. 
Mr. Lepevsky, why do you think the minister has been so reluctant to, or, or seems to be so reluctant to take that decisive action that you've just described? I've never spoken to the minister. We've had no contact with them, and I can't comment on it. My only reason for focusing on that is because of the, the, the news release yesterday about a summit. And, I, and I'm not, I don't want to make like whatever they do is wrong and all that stuff. We're not like that. It's just we need action, not, not photo ops. If they do a photo op and do action, we'll say yay. <laughs> okay, don't get me wrong. So in, in your view, the government knows what needs to be done. Uh, they've had lots of time to do it. And in response to this litany of horrifying stories involving people with disabilities trying to travel, and we heard um, testimony from the, the chief accessibility officer, and, and she very much echoed what you've said, which is that every single person that, that she knows uh, that travel that has a disability and, and travels has had problems. Um, given the severity of that situation, you think that the government has all the information that it needs to act. Is that what I'm hearing? As does the Canadian Transportation Agency, as does every airline. And, and, and they have models from elsewhere in the world they could turn to because not everybody does it as, as badly as we do, and that's why I dread entering Canadian airspace. Others do it better. I'm not saying they're all 100% either, but they're more reliable than here. What are the international leaders when it comes to the type of regulation and enforcement you're talking about? I, I can't give you sort of specific regulatory codes and specifics. I'm not prepared for that today, and I apologize. But I, I can just tell you, I, I don't recall a trip anywhere um, of the you know, handful of countries uh, or more that I've been to where, where I, I have to worry like I have to worry when I come here. Thank you very much, Mr. Lepofsky, and thank you, Mr. Backrack. Next, we have Mr. Muse. Mr. Muse, the floor is yours. Five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to both witnesses for very passionate uh, advocacy uh, and, and some practical solutions, which I, which I know are being captured by the analysts. Uh, as we look to the report on this. And I, I just want to pick up on the thread from uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Bacharach. You know, you, you said, Mr. Lepofsky, right off the top, that uh, in the United States there's an Air Passengers uh, with a Disabilities Bill of Rights, and that's obviously something that we should look to uh, because we, we want to... Uh, <laughs> we don't want Canada to be an airspace that you dread. Um, and, and, and I know that... Um, the question was asked about other jurisdictions as to, to maybe others that are leaders on this, and, and you weren't prepared for that today, but I don't know if, if, if it would be something that uh, you'd be able to table the committee uh, afterwards. Uh, if there were other jurisdictions... If we could find where, something, we'd be happy to provide it. Sure. I mean, because obviously we should look to what are uh, far better examples than, uh, than you're experiencing in Canada. But, but frankly, that's also... I mean, the CTA is paid to try to know this stuff, and uh, the federal government should have people who could That's come fair. before you and give you this. You shouldn't need lay volunteers. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not faulting you for asking. Don't no, no, get me no, wrong. No, no, I appreciate that. It's like, again, inconsistency is in part because people don't tell us uh, where to go if you want to get curbside assistance or have one stop shopping. They don't have that uh, uh, hotline to call when you're at the airport. I mean, try to get someone at the airport to go to a higher level to solve a problem that the front desk person can't solve uh, because they don't have authority. You can't find anyone. You need that one-stop uh, shopping phone number with somebody with authority to fix it. Uh, you need these to be announced regularly. I think that if airline staff and airport staff heard those announcements, if you have a disability-related complaint, call this number, it'll wake people up a little more to say, hey, you know, we should do better. Thank and I want you. to emphasize, I'm going to gamble that a lot of the frustration I'm describing would be echoed by flight attendants and ground staff. Because when I've talked to them about it, they've echoed that they've seen the same problems we have and that they as individuals find it enormously frustrating. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lepofsky, and thank you, Mr. Muse. Next, we have Mr. Yakino. Mr. Yakino, the floor is yours. You have five minutes, please. I'd like to start by thanking the witnesses for being here this morning. I want to thank you for your very touching testimony and actually... It's quite disturbing to hear the experiences you've had traveling. It's hard to believe that in 2024 we haven't managed to better serve uh, individuals who have accessibility needs. 
Professor, you have a wide range of experience. We've clearly understood, and we don't have to, you know, I'm, I'm very disappointed to hear about your bad experiences, and on behalf of the government, I apologize. I would like to ask you, how can we address this issue best, address it? Many, many things need to be done, but what would be one thing that could be done to bring about change? You mentioned a one-stop shop. Is that the ideal solution? That's my first question. My second question, you said you had 19 recommendations. Do you Did you design them based on all of your travel experience all over the world, outside of Canada as well? Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Thank you. I'll tell you that we designed those based on our research, based on feedback uh, that we've been getting from people for, you know, as a, a community coalition, we get feedback on barriers all the time. We get called by the media about stories uh, and asked to comment on them and so on. So it's kind of an aggregation of that and just traveling and looking around and trying to figure out what works. And of course, my own personal experience is uh, provided. I gave you illustrations as that from my life, not because I'm the only game in town or, or in any way important, but because they will make them come alive for you uh, in a way that I think especially is compelling. Um, but as well, um, we've just tried to apply uh, a common sense, like offering the idea of uh, if it's really hard to get from the front door at Pearson Terminal 1 to get all the way through this phalanx of, of obstacles uh, and a long distance to find where the check-in desk is, and there's so many. The idea of, why don't you just have an entrance right inside the door? Something which Air Canada did, then undid, then redid, but limited as to who could use it. I mean, again, you shouldn't... That was just one example at a big airport that like that. You might not need it in Ottawa because it's a shorter distance to the counter, but at a bigger airport, that would be an illustration of something that's good. There isn't one solution alone. But what I will tell you about the 19 in our, our, in our brief, the one that I realize will make this as the, uh, would require the most dramatic move is removing the accessibility uh, mandate from the CTA and creating a new agency to deal with it. I, I realize that's a bigger uh, fish to fry. But the other things in there are all, I, I would I'd propose, quite easy to do. And it's Thank not you. just Thank one you of them. Professor, I just before my time sure. is up, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, is it possible for you to share with us those 19 recommendations? Yeah, they're in the brief that we filed with you. Okay, and, and in it, you have the examples where you've picked them up, those, yeah. those, uh, those 19 recommendations? We like, just invented them. No, no, I, I'm sure you didn't invent them. I, no, but we, no, we explained them. But from which, like, is there a reference to where this is being done today so we have a better picture of where we to go to see how it's being done? Uh, best practices? No, there isn't. And I'm, we could look to see whether we could do that. If we can, we will. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yakino. Thank you, Mr. Lepofsky. Prochainement, nous avons Mr. Barcelo Duval. Mr. Barcelo Duval. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll continue uh, on my original train of thought. Let's keep going with Mr. Lepofsky. Lepofsky. In your opening statement, you said that it would take legislation that would include rights for people with limited mobility similar to what exists in the United States. Here, of course, you have airline passengers' rights that, that is in the form of regulations, and it's been the case since 2019. What's the difference between what exists in the U.S. and what exists here from a legal standpoint, and how could we manage to get what they have if it's any better? How could we change or amend what we've got here? We actually quote it, I believe, in our brief. And it's uh, theirs is just a short list of categorical clear rights. Now, if we were writing one for Canada, if you, if, if you this committee or the government decided we're going to draft one, uh, we might add to it, vary it. We don't need to just carbon copy it. Um, we should take into account some of the problems that, that this committee has seen. But the, the idea of, of having that Bill of Rights, having it be enforceable, having a hotline, and having it mandatorily notified to all passengers 
when they book a ticket uh, with the airline and so on, uh, would help move things forward. And it's it's not hard. And it's it's shouldn't be full of the uh, the uh, the feast of loopholes in the CTA's 2019 uh, regulations. Uh, that's what I'd suggest. Donc, ce que, ce que je comprends, c'est que dans ce que vous avez... From what I gather, in what you submitted, you have a list of rights that people have, example, as opposed to a whole host of loopholes and pack, complicated packages, the simple rights e that are easy to interpret, that, that would lead to better results, according to you? So major principles, basically. Yes. Well, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be principles. I mean... The airline shall tell people uh, with dis passengers with disabilities what services are available and what number to reach them at. That's not a principle. It's just a clear direction. So they, they, it doesn't have to be kind of lofty, um, as, you know, aspirational. It can be concrete entitlement. Thank you very much, Mr. Lepofsky. Merci, Mr. Barcelouval. And finally for today, we have Mr. Backrack. Mr. Backrack, the floor is yours. You have two and a half minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Lepofsky started by recognizing uh, the law students at Western who've contributed to this work. And I wanted to take a, a quick moment to recognize my staff, especially Margaret Crew, for her work. I understand that you um, were in touch with her in, in preparation for today's meeting. Um, it seems like one of the aspects we're talking about is trying to define the scope and the scale of the problem that we face. And while we could take actions like the ones that you've recommended in the absence of precise and accurate data, it strikes me that it would be useful to be able to track progress over time. And to do that, we need better information about um, how, how the problem is doing. Is, is that a, a fair assumption? And if it is, uh, what would you recommend in terms of data collection and reporting so that we can have a, a good sense of whether progress is being made on this issue. Yes, it's a good idea. We, we don't need to wait for data to know these are problems. Like, we don't need to wait to see how many times they've failed to announce pre-boarding, like they did on my flight last night, to know that we needed measure to ensure they announce pre-boarding. However, there are these measures. Number one, secret shoppers, not by the airline, but by the, an independent regulator who are auditing on site what's going on. Number two, requiring uh, that the airlines file with the uh, regulator all the complaints they receive. They can be, of course, anonymized. Uh, number three, requiring the airlines at airports, as I said earlier, to publicly announce a, a simple, easy to access phone number to register complaints or, and an email address. Uh, and a mailing address, so that those will, because we'll hear from more people if in real time we tell them how to, that you can and where to do it. And then if all of that is provided with the air, to the airlines, not just some statistics, but the, what the complaints are, in fairness to the airlines, just because someone complains doesn't mean that's the, that those are the facts. But you can at least look at it to see what kind of recurring patterns you see. So that if you get all of those complaints, and even if you assume that half of them are inaccurate, but you still see a huge trend, that tells you where you need to take regulatory action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Backrack, and thank you, Ms. Wakis, as well as Mr. Lepofsky, for uh, being here, for sharing your expertise and your testimony with us. And I'd like to thank you on behalf of this committee for your steadfast advocacy and service to Canadians with disabilities. With that, that concludes our testimony for today, and this meeting is adjourned.